स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया as a corollary to the bursa theorem we proved that if omega is a convex domain and if uh, gamma is a closed polygonal path in omega then for any holomorphic function f on omega integral of f over the closed polygonal path is zero now by using the second fundamental theorem of calculus a complex analog of the second fundamental theorem of calculus which was proved in the last week we can immediately conclude a version of cauchy's theorem in the case of convex domains so let me start by uh, this is sometimes also called the local version of the cauchy's theorem so cauchy's theorem for convex domains so let omega be a convex open set and f uh, from omega to c be holomorphic on omega then f has an anti derivative in omega and if gamma is a closed rectifiable curve in omega then integral of f over gamma is equal to 0 we don't have much to do here the proof is basically a direct application of the cauchy's theorem for polygonal paths let me recall the statement for you it's uh, it's stating the following suppose we have a convex domain and if we consider a polygonal path which is closed and if f is holomorphic on omega then the integral of f over the polygonal path is zero now if you go back to the previous weeks lectures and look at the second fundamental theorem of calculus the precise requirement for uh, a function f to have uh, an anti derivative is that its integral over polygonal paths is equal to zero so by the second fundamental theorem of calculus we can directly conclude that f has an anti derivative since integral of f over uh, sigma is equal to zero for any uh, closed polygonal path sigma in omega we have by the second fundamental theorem of calculus we call complex analog an explicit anti derivative capital f uh on omega now the moment we have an anti derivative we can now use the first fundamental theorem of calculus to conclude the second statement which now i'm going to underline if gamma is a closed rectifiable curve then integral of f over gamma is equal to 0 this follows if uh, f small f has an explicit anti derivative on omega by the second by the first fundamental theorem of calculus integral of f over gamma is equal to 0 for every 
rectifiable gamma since f has an explicit antiderivative. So, in particular, if we pick two curves gamma 0 and gamma 1 from z 0 to z 1, then integral of f over gamma 0 is going to be equal to the integral of f over gamma 1. By considering gamma 0 plus minus of gamma 1, we can conclude whatever I just said. Right. So, let us go back to the statement here. Why was it mentioned that this is a Cauchy's theorem? The conclusion here is what we have in the second variant of Cauchy's theorem which was stated in the uh, previous lecture. And we in fact showed that Cauchy's theorem uh, which was stated initially and the second variant are logically equivalent. So, this is exactly telling us the Cauchy's theorem when omega is a convex domain. But then convex domains are very special. For example, disks, rectangles, all these, the interior of a rectangle, all these are convex domains, but they are very special. We, and we would like to uh, prove now the more general statement of Cauchy's theorem. Get to proving Cauchy's theorem in the general setting. So, proof of Cauchy's theorem. So, let me recall Cauchy's theorem for you once more. Let omega be an open subset in the complex plane and f be a function on omega which is holomorphic. Let us consider two curves gamma 0 and gamma 1 with the same initial point and the same terminal point such that gamma 0 is homotopic to gamma uh, reparameterization of gamma 1. Let me write that down. Let gamma 0 come a b to omega and uh, gamma 1 say from c d to omega be uh, rectifiable curves. As of now, we would like to speak about integral over these curves. So, let us and find ourselves to rectifiable curves on omega from z0 to z1. This just means that the initial point of both gamma 0 and gamma 1 uh, is z0 and the initial and the terminal point of gamma 0 and gamma 1 is z1. So, suppose we have two such curves from z0 to z1 and such that gamma 0 is homotopic. To a reparameterization of gamma 1, then the conclusion is that integral of f over gamma 0 is the same as the integral of f over gamma 1. I would like to point out that the second statement that we had given in the last lecture for the Cauchy's theorem for closed curves for gamma 0's, gamma 0 and gamma 1 closed curves which are homotopic as uh, closed curves. The conclusion that integral of f over gamma 0 is equal to the uh, integral of f over gamma 1 that follows from this particular statement. I will leave that as an exercise for you to really sit down and uh, verify based on the exercises and properties of uh, a homotopy which we had given in the first lecture of this week. Right now, we will be proving this particular statement of Cauchy's theorem. So, let me re recall the statement for you. If we have two curves gamma 0 and gamma 1 which are homotopic with fixed endpoints, how did I mention that? Homotopic with fixed endpoints. then the integral of f over gamma 0 is the same as the integral of f over gamma 1. Let us give a proof of this statement. The first thing to note is that integral of f over gamma 1 is the same as integral of f over a reparameterization of gamma 1. Since the integral is invariant under reparameterization,
we may assume that gamma 1 is also defined on AB. After a linear homeomorphism from CD to AB, we can get hold of a reparameterization of gamma 1 defined on AB and the integral of f over this reparameterization is the same as the integral f uh, over gamma 1. So, we will just prove that we just need to prove that the integral of f over gamma 0 is the same as the integral of, integral of f over this uh, curve gamma the reparameterization of gamma 1. So, we may as well start off with the curve gamma 1 as being defined on AB. Okay. The Hypothesis tells us that there is a homotopy from gamma 0 to gamma 1. Let us give the homotopy a name, let h from 0 1 cross a b into omega be a homotopy with fixed endpoints from gamma 0 to gamma 1. So, in particular, h is a continuous function on 0, 1 cross, cross a b is a compact subset of r and uh, continuous functions take compact subsets to compact subsets. So, we have 0, 1 cross a b is compact implies h of the image h of 0 1 cross a b is compact in omega. So, notice that h is a function into omega. So, this is going to be a compact subset of omega. I think h of 0 1 cross a b is compact uh, by let u 1 u 2 up to u n be open subsets of omega such that u j bar is contained in omega and h of 0 1 cross a b is contained in the union may be contained in the union of u j where j is from 1 to n. of omega the answer is that uh, for every point on h of 0 1 cross a b we have some epsilon such that the the closure of uh, being an interior point we can we can get hold of an epsilon such that the closure of the disk of radius epsilon around h of s comma t for whatever point s and t we pick in 0 1 cross a b that is contained in our given domain omega now take the cover of the image by such uh, domains such uh, disks and uh, by compactness we have a finite subcover. Call the elements in this subcover as u1, u2 up to u1. That certainly satisfies the condition we have written. So, we have crucially used the fact that the image is a compact subset of omega here to conclude that there exists u1, u2 up to un which satisfies this condition. And now let r be the Lebesgue number. corresponding to this cover. Recall that Le Lebesgue number satisfies the property that if for any point in h of 0 1 cross a b, let us take say s comma t in 0 1 cross a b, then h of s comma t will be a point in the image, then the disk of radius r around h of s comma t will be contained in one of the uis and hence contained in omega. That is the key thing we are going to uh, conclude from this. So, let me just give this collection a name Lebesgue number corresponding to script u. Then for any s comma t in 0 1 cross a b the disk of radius r around h of s comma t is contained in omega. That is precisely what we have. It will be contained in some uj, which in particular is contained in omega. 
I will bring the compactor once more and uh, notice that H being continuous on a compact set implies that it is uniformly continuous there. Since 0, 1 cross AB is compact, we have crucially used the compactness here as you can see. H is uniformly continuous. on 0 1 cross a b and hence there exists some delta there exists delta positive such that h of s comma s comma t minus h of s comma s prime comma t prime this is less than uh, let us say r by 4 whenever mod of s minus s prime is less than delta and mod of t minus t prime is less than delta. So, so this is just rewriting the uniform continuity of h in terms of epsilons and deltas. Here epsilon is r by 4 and the delta is the corresponding delta. We have now developed the setup with on which we will be able to prove the Cauchy's theorem. Let us now take a partition of 0, 1 and a b such that it is uh, partition size is less than delta. Let us do that. Let uh, 0 equal to s 0 less than s 1 less than say up to s n equal to 1 be a partition of 0 1 such that absolute value of s j minus s j minus 1 this is less than delta. Oh, maybe I should not just put it this way. Let us call this P1 such that the partition size is less than delta. That is that's good enough. Similarly, let P2 A equal to T0 less than T1 less than up to say Tm equal to B be a partition of AB such that the partition size of P2 is less than delta. So, we have picked a couple of partitions. So, it is time to draw a picture to capture all that we have done. Suppose we have a domain and uh, suppose we have a curve gamma 0 from say Z0 to uh, Z1. And suppose we have a curve, this is gamma 0. And suppose we have another curve this is say gamma 1 from again z 0 to uh, they are not coming out well. Let us see. Uh, this is better. This is gamma 1 from again z 0 to z 1 such that it is homotopic and we have picked partitions. So, partitions will be of this type. So, there will be at s 1 I will draw it with uh, another color red is the curve at the stage of s 1. So, this is uh, gamma s 1. So, this is just gamma s 0 as you can notice. And this is just gamma s n. And let us pick violet to capture say gamma s 2 and so on. So, we can have uh, for each of these s i's, if you look at h of s j comma t, that is gamma s j, and that is captured by such curves. We also have a partition now of uh, the interval a b and how is that going to, so I will just use orange here to capture the partitions here. So, this is say t 1 or rather gamma 0 of t 1, this is gamma 0 of t 2, gamma 0 of t 3 and so on. Similarly, we have gamma s 1 of t 1, gamma s 1 of t 2 and so on.
so we have partitioned our interval a b in this manner and we are looking at the image we are we are interested in the image here we have captured our partition in in the image here let's try to see what can be done further let's get hold of a path let's see i j denote the polygonal path gamma from h of s i t j to h of s i t j minus 1 to h of s i minus 1 t j minus 1 to h of s i minus 1 to t j to h of s i t j so let me just uh, draw that as well for you so as you can see there are four straight lines in this polygonal path let me use a green to capture that so this is our ij we go along a straight line to uh, h of s i t j minus 1 and then we go along a straight line to h of s i minus 1 t j minus 1 along a straight line to h of uh, s of i minus 1 to t j and then back to h of s j s i t j so this is the path that we have just defined okay what is the speciality of this path uh, you can see i have just used the notation c i j to make the notation compact uh, the key thing to note is that the uh, diameter of c i j this is going to be less than uh, well it is certainly less than r because the partition size is less than delta implies that each of these straight lines is going to be less than r by 4 notice that our uh, delta was picked so that the uh, difference h of s minus s t minus h of s prime t prime is less than r by 4 whenever the uh, distance of s to s prime is less than delta and distance of t to t prime is less than delta that uh, this condition is satisfied has been ensured by the uh, the way partition has been picked so cij certainly has diameter less than r in this case and uh, because of that hence cij is contained in the disk of radius r around s i t j but then what do we know about the disk of radius r around s i t j we in particular know that it is a convex subset and by the uh, cauchy's theorem for the polygonal paths on convex sets by cauchy's theorem for polygonal paths on convex uh, open sets we have the integral of f along cij is equal to 0 so good because we have just proved that the integral of uh, f over cij Uh, is uh, equal to zero for each of these i's and j's. So, what is that? The i j is a polygonal path which consists of the four straight lines, and therefore the integral of f over the c i j's will be the integral, the sum of the integrals over these straight lines. Using this fact, we can prove that it's an exercise for you to check this particular fact. The integral. over both i sum over 1 to n and j from 1 to m of integral of f over c i j what will this be let's just go back to the figure uh, it's such a good exercise for you to sit and uh, check this out if you take this green uh, green color polygonal path and if you pick the 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 blue color polygonal path which i am going to draw now 
and if you take the sum of the integral of f over these two parts the straight line which is encircled by yellow the integral over these uh, over this particular straight line cancels off each other because one is going to be the reversal of the other and when you add it up the integral cancels off and uh, the integral will be over the polygonal path which is now being drawn in yellow this is an exercise for you to sit down and convince yourself that when you take the sum of uh, the integral of f of dz, f of z dz over the cijs, this is going to be equal to the integral of f of z dz over the following curve c. I will write it here. where c is the uh, polygonal path which is defined in the following manner it is going to be h okay it is the polygonal path connecting h of uh, 1 comma t m to h of 1 comma t m minus 1 all the way up to h of 1 comma t 0 to h of 0 comma t 1 and all the way back to h of 0 comma t m. What is that? We have used the fact that h is a homotopy with fixed endpoints very crucially to conclude this particular fact. We now write c as the concatenation of two polygonal paths connecting z 0 to z 1 where z0 was the initial point of gamma 0 and z1 was the initial, uh, terminal point of gamma 0. Let us do that. C is equal to uh, minus of gamma 1 plus gamma 2. Maybe gamma is not a good notation to use. Minus of sigma 1 plus where sigma 1 is a path from uh, h of, okay. Gamma, it is a polygonal path from 1 t 0 all the way up to 1 t m and sigma 2 is the polygonal path from 0 t 0 all the way up to h of 0 comma t m. If you notice minus of sigma 1 is now a path from h of 1 comma t m, the polygonal path from h of 1 comma t m to uh, h of 1 comma t 0 by reversing the straight lines involved or let me just put a equivalence here because uh, this is just a reparameterization of this curve. So, I should maybe write this c is then uh, reparameterization of minus of sigma 1 plus sigma 2. But that is good enough for us because we are only interested in the integral of f over c. We are not per se interested in the curve c itself. An integral of f over c will be equal to integral of f over a reparameterization, which is minus of sigma 1, which the reparameterization which we are interested is uh, the one corresponding to minus of sigma 1 plus sigma 2. And this by the various properties of integral is just integral of f of z dz over sigma 1 or rather sigma 2 minus the integral of f of z dz over sigma 1. Okay, so what have we established? We have established that integral over c of f of z dz is the sum of the integral over c ij's of f of z dz. But we have just noticed that the integral of uh, f of z dz over c i j's are all 0 and therefore the sum is also going to be 0. Let me now note, since integral of f of z dz over c i j is equal to 0 for all i comma j, we have integral of f of z dz over c is 0 which implies that integral of f of z dz over sigma 1 is equal to the integral of 
f of z dz over sigma 2. So, what have we finally established? Let us go back. We have still not proved our result. We have only established that if we look at the uh, pink polygonal path which I am drawing right now. If you look at this particular polygonal path that is going to be sigma 0 and the uh, polygonal path which I am drawing here that is going to be this is going to be sigma 1. So, what we have shown is that the integral of f over sigma 0 is the same as integral of f over sigma 1. We are only one step away from establishing what we want. We want to establish that integral of f over gamma 0 is the same as integral of f over gamma 1. We will just show that integral of f over sigma 0 is the same as integral of f over gamma 0. That is quite straightforward again because we have already proved that when we have when we are in a convex set, then if you consider gamma 0 and gamma 1 two paths from the uh, same initial point to the same terminal point, then the integral of f over gamma uh, over the first curve is the same as the integral of f over the second curve. Rather, what we will now do is that the restriction of gamma 0 to Tj, Tj plus 1 is contained in dh of uh, 0 Tj comma r because of the very choice of our uh, uh, partition. The deltas were picked in such a manner that it will be in fact contained in uh, a disk of radius r by 4. In particular, it is contained in a disk of radius r. Similarly, gamma of h of 0 comma tj to h of 0 comma tj minus 1. The image of this is also contained in. So, when I say is contained in, the image of this is contained in. That is what it means. So, maybe I, I can write it that way of tj, tj minus, tj plus 1 rather. This is contained in d of h0 tj and this is also similarly contained of 0 comma 1. This is also contained in d h0 tj comma r. And we know that d h of 0 comma tj comma r that is a disk of radius r around uh, h of 0 comma tj which in particular is a convex set and therefore by Cauchy's theorem on convex sets which we just proved in the beginning of this lecture integral of f over gamma 0 restricted to tj tj plus 1 this is equal to the integral of f of z dz of gamma h 0 tj to h of 0 tj plus 1. Now, notice that sigma 0 is the concatenation of these type of paths and therefore, integral of f over sigma 0, this is just equal to the integral of gamma h 0 t 0 to gamma uh, h 0 t m of f of z dz, which is the sum of uh, integral gamma h 0 t j to h 0 t j plus 1 of f of z dz where j is from 0 to m minus 1 and this is equal to the sum of integral f of z dz over gamma 0 restricted to t j t j plus 1 again j from 0 to m minus 1 and this is just equal to the integral of f of z dz over gamma 0 restricted to 0 t 0 plus the concatenation of these curves t m minus 1 to t m which in particular is equal to the integral of f of z dz over gamma 0. So, we have just established that the integral of f of z dz over sigma 0 is the same as the integral of f of z dz over gamma 0. Similarly, we can establish 
that integral of f of z dz over sigma 1 is equal to the integral of f of z dz over sigma over gamma 1. And we have just seen that integral of f over sigma 0 is the same as integral of f over sigma 1. And therefore, we conclude that integral of f over gamma 0 is equal to the integral of f over gamma 1. With this, we conclude the proof of Cauchy's theorem. Cauchy's theorem is actually a very powerful tool in the following sense. We have only defined integral of a continuous function over rectifiable curves. We did not weaken the, the curves, the, the regularity of curves more than rectifiable curves when, when we define the integral. However, if you consider uh, an arbitrary uh, continuous curve in a given domain omega and uh, if we are to ask what can be the definition of integral of a holomorphic function over this curve gamma, then we can actually use the technique which we proved, which we used to prove the Cauchy's theorem, break the uh, interval of definition of uh, the curve gamma into uh, small pieces. Look at the polygonal path which connects the partitioned points and then define the integral of f to be the integral over this polygonal path. Cauchy's theorem tells us that this definition will be well defined because if you take any other uh, polygonal path of this type which is homotopic to our given curve gamma, then it will be by equivalence of homotopy, it will be uh, homotopic to uh, any other, uh, the, the polygonal path which was used to define and therefore the definition will be well defined. Uh, we already started this lecture by proving Cauchy's theorem in the in the uh, case when omega was a convex domain and that was crucially used to prove the general Cauchy's theorem. But we let me note a statement uh, for a very special class of domains called simply connected domains. Mm -hmm. An open set omega is said to be simply connected if every closed curve in omega is null homotopic. If every closed curve gamma at z0 is null homotopic. Recall that a curve, a closed curve is null homotopic if it can be homotope to a constant curve, null homotopic to the constant curve at z0. Such domains are good because then we can say something about a special case of Cauchy's theorem for simply connected domains. Let omega be simply connected. and uh, f be a function holomorphic on omega, then integral of f over gamma is equal to 0 for every closed rectifiable curve. gamma in omega. What is that if it is closed it can be homotope to the constant point and by Cauchy's theorem we have integral of f over a constant curve is 0 and therefore integral of f over gamma is also equal to 0. The conclusion is quite straightforward. The uh, second fundamental theorem of calculus can be used here to now say that hence every holomorphic function on a simply connected domain will have an explicit antiderivative.